and welcome to episode 5 of Adafruit and DigiKeys All the Internet of Things, a six part series that covers everything you need to know about IoT. This video series has built up from the basics to more advanced topics as we take you through the journey of IoT best practices. In previous episodes, we've discussed the transports, protocols, and services you need to craft your IoT functionality. We've also showed off working example code for sending and receiving data with MQTT versus REST, and when to use Wi-Fi, Ethernet, cellular, or Bluetooth so that you can start making the right decisions for which transports and protocols to use. So, you'd think that you have everything you need to design and manufacture your IoT product, right? Whoa, that wasn't supposed to happen but it does demonstrate the most important but often forgotten element of IoT design. And perhaps not coincidentally, what we'll be discussing in this episode, security. The running joke is that the S in IoT stands for security, because it's never there. But safety and security is something you will need to think about at all steps of your design process. There's going to be billions of IoT devices online around the world, many of which will be connected to the internet, and almost all of them will be unmonitored. A 2015 survey by authentication service provider Auth0 found that 85% of IoT developers admitted to being pressured to get a product to market before adequate security could be implemented. And as an engineer, you're probably used to that pressure to get a product to market, which means selling features often get more attention than security. With more and more of these connected devices being rushed to market, they've become a lucrative target. The 2016 Mirai botnet attack used unsecured CCTV cameras that were connected to the internet to launch a crippling denial of service attack. That hack wasn't even one using the cameras to spy on people. It was just using the TCP IP stack of the embedded Linux device to send lots of junk traffic. And we're not even getting into the hacks that could really threaten human safety, like remote-controlled ovens or self-driving cars. So while it might not seem like a big deal when you have an unsophisticated IoT device that has maybe just a temperature sensor and a modem, that device could be used as a launching point for a coordinated attack platform. And if you do have sensors like cameras or microphones, those could be remotely enabled and turned into listening spy devices. Having security as a priority for your engineering and marketing team will not just help you sleep well at night. As we've seen with the European GDPR regulations, privacy and security are being legislated. Having poor security will now get you fined or banned in the marketplace. It's nearly impossible to add security after the fact, so if you want to avoid a devastating recall, listen up and take security seriously. Now, before we start looking at attack and defense mechanisms, let's talk about why your hardware might get hacked. Knowing what people want to do with your hardware will give you a sense of the actors involved and their motivations. Why would anyone want to hack your hardware? When we talk about hacking your hardware, we mean unauthorized access and use of the device and data within it. That doesn't necessarily mean repurposing or improving it. After all, we're makers here at Adafruit, and modifying off-the-shelf hardware is an engineer's favorite pastime. So for example, recycling a Bluetooth step counter into a doggy activity tracker, it's not hacking. But being able to access, read, and modify that same step counter data without permission from the owner would be. For IoT devices that connect to the internet, there are a few common reasons we see for compromising hardware. The first common type of hack is creating a DDoS botnet, that is, for distributed denial of service attacks. DDoS attacks use several or even thousands of compromised or co-opted computers, also known as bots, to inundate an online service with coordinated data requests which overwhelm the target and take it offline. This can be used as part of a revenge scheme to punish a competitor or as a protection racket to demand money in exchange for calling off the attack. And it's popular because there's plenty of software packages to manage botnets, and that means it doesn't require a lot of skill to do. As we mentioned earlier, the infamous Mirai malware infected thousands of IoT camera devices to turn them into a launch platform for DDoS attacks. By automatically hacking into and taking over insecure IoT devices, the Mirai virus quickly spread through thousands of cameras connected to the internet, 
turning them into bots. And then sometime later, those bots were wielded in the DDoS attack. Botnet infected devices will have degraded performance, but are very hard to detect if you don't know what to look for. And with the proliferation of cryptocurrency, some botnets are being turned into crypto farms, where your device is used to mine virtual cash. So far, this has been happening with hacked servers and desktop computers, but we'll see this more and more as IoT devices become more powerful. Some single board computers are now nearly desktop speed, and if you're controlling thousands of them, it can add up. We suppose it's better than attacking a third party, but that hashing software will make your device slow down, and that could cause support issues when your customers are disappointed with the performance of your IoT product. Botnet hacks are extremely common, but you'll also see hacks that attempt to steal personal data, especially passwords and payment information. Without question, you should avoid having any way for your IoT device to interact with money, either sending or receiving, because that will make it a huge target. That goes extra if the money is untraceable, such as cryptocurrency, because it's so easy to launder. Storing and managing credit card data is so incredibly dangerous that it's beyond the scope of this video. Suffice to say that there are whole industries surrounding mandated PCI compliance. You will need to follow those rules if you want to process credit cards. Usernames and passwords, if they're extractable, are valuable on the black market. They're used to try and log into other services with reused or shared login info where money or compute resources may be available. Finally, the user data. See how many steps they took per day or video from Wi-Fi cameras may be used to harass or abuse your customers. These sorts of hacks are sometimes one at a time exposures where customers tricked into giving someone their password, but sometimes an entire backend database will be downloaded and having that data exposed will be devastating to your customers. Once your products are known as untrustworthy, it's extremely hard to regain that customer trust. So treat their data as if it was your own, which it kind of is. Let's take a look at the types of attacks that can be used to compromise IoT devices so that we know what to defend against. Sun Tzu wrote, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. And knowing what to defend against will let you prioritize your time and energy. Attacks are how your opponent will be trying to crack your security so they can gain control or extract information from your IoT device. Some attacks are easy to counter. Some are extremely hard. How much time and money that you spend will depend on what you're protecting and protecting against. The most common type of attack is an automated login tool that will try to connect to every IP address on a network and log in using default passwords or common passwords. For example, if an IoT camera is connected to the open internet and has a default password and login of admin admin, that would be super easy to automate with a script. Every time a new IoT device is sold on the market with a default login, that's added to that hacking list so that the script will try anything it can. These tools are incredibly effective because they can sweep through millions of IP addresses around the world while the hacker is sound asleep. Luckily, this attack is really easy to defend against and you must spend the effort. Most obvious is just don't have a default password. Instead, have the password distributed with the product on a sticker, just like your Wi-Fi router has. You can guess who got bit by the security flaw for after many years. Make sure the password is long enough and complex enough and cannot be guessed. And don't use public information in generating the password, like a MAC address. A close relative to that attack is the automated vulnerability exploit tool. Say you have the bestest, longest password, but it turns out there's a flaw in the firmware or operating system you're running. That flaw could be exploited to allow an outsider access into the device, even without a password. The good news is that these exploits are not very common if you've configured your IoT operating system well. The bad news is that when they do happen, they can be catastrophic. There's no defense against them other than upgrading or patching the software. And there's no way to predict or protect against it. Even the most expensive and proprietary systems can have these flaws. In this case, all you can do is take steps to minimize the risk and maximize the ability to repair. If at all possible, do not have a public-facing internet administration system. Disable SSH, FTP, Telnet, web serving, as well as any other service you can do without. Run the latest operating systems and have a way for users to update the firmware 
or have an automatic update that can be fetched and installed by the system itself. If there's an app, have it remind the user to update constantly. And if possible, have a way of contacting customers so you can let them know if there's an emergency upgrade. It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. The next most common set of attacks will group together and call the sniffing, spoofing, replay, and man in the middle group. Sniffing is the ability to listen in on the communications going on inside or through your device. Spoofing is being able to trick the device into trusting something it should not. Replay is sending data, often sniff data, over again to the device. Sometimes this lets the hacker repeat an event, sort of like spending the same quarter twice. Men in the middle attacks are a little like a cross between sniffing and spoofing. You get in the middle of the device communications, shuffling data back and forth, but modifying the data to suit the hacking needs. These techniques are often used together. For example, let's say you have an IoT device with a login website. You've got a unique password, but you forgot to require encryption for the connection. Your customer logs into the device from the coffee shop across the street, and it turns out that the coffee shop's network has been hacked due to that default login password on the Wi-Fi router. And someone is listening to all that Wi-Fi traffic. They record the login and password for the IoT device, and then they will use it. That's a sniffing attack. Or say you want to defend against the automated exploits class of attacker. So you create an over-the-air firmware update service that will send updated firmware once a week. A hacker buys one of your devices and listens into the network traffic during the firmware update and discovers you forgot to authenticate the connection. With some effort, she's able to craft a custom firmware upgrade that creates a default login backdoor and deploys it in an automated fashion across the internet, targeting every installation of the device for global domination. That's a spoofing attack. That's not all the attacks you have to worry about. There's a long tail of many more ways to trick computer devices. After all, computers do whatever we ask, without judgment. For some companies, especially ones with health, safety, or money on the line, there's a lot of continuous research needed to keep up to date with attack vectors and stay ahead. For most others, it's better to follow the best practices we'll outline than do nothing. And as your company and product succeeds, you can invest more into improving the security, such as hiring specialists. Some things that you shouldn't focus all your time on is worrying about your hardware manufacturing modifying your design to add spy technology to the PCB. We're not saying it's impossible, just that while these sorts of attacks get a lot of attention, they are very expensive and time consuming compared to the automated attack scripts that are your greatest risk. When you outsource your manufacturer, there are some risks involved. Your contract manufacturer is most likely to swap components on you using lower quality or cloned components or perhaps they'll sell off your IP to a competitor rather than trying to modify your hardware. If you're the kind of company that has to seriously worry about state-level attackers with vast resources, you're also the kind of company that owns their own manufacturer or can afford to staff the CM with auditors. That said, after you go into manufacture, it's not a bad idea to disassemble and inspect a few random boards from your fabrication run to catch quality and security issues, such as, are those unique passwords really unique? Have your firmware images cryptographically signed and authenticated, and then verify them post-manufacture by your in-house team or a trusted auditor. Of course, this isn't all the different ways you're going to get attacked, just some of the most common ones. So, how are you going to protect your design? Attack surface reduction is a security principle that you can use to guide your choices when designing an IoT product or service. The attack surface of a hardware or software environment is all of the different ways where an unauthorized user can try to insert or extract data. Keeping the attack surface as small as possible is a basic but necessary security measure. With IoT, there's two surfaces you'll have to contend with. The thing itself, say an internet connected temperature sensor, and the service, whether that's Adafruit I.O., Google Cloud, or Microsoft Azure. Let's start with device security starting from the easiest first. Here are a dozen or so guidelines for device security. Again, this isn't everything, but it's an excellent start. Number one, require a login and password. This is number one because it's the bare minimum. Don't have an open network accessible interface to your IoT device. You may think, oh, nobody's gonna guess the URL or the port number, but that's the first thing hackers will find out. Even if it's on an intranet, require some authentication. 
Number two, don't have default logins and passwords. We mentioned this before, but it bears repeating because it's so common. Make sure your device has a unique, unguessable password by default. Number three, two-factor authentication. In addition to a username and password, maybe have an SMS or time-based second factor. This will protect you even when the password is sniffed or stolen. Two-factor is free and pretty easy to implement these days. You no longer have to distribute a physical token since everyone has a mobile phone. Number four, require TLS SSL. Whenever your users or devices connect to the internet, whether over Wi-Fi or cellular, use the latest version of TLS, sometimes called SSL or HTTPS. TLS will encrypt all data between the device and the service, protecting both. This will greatly reduce your risk of sniffing. A few years ago, microcontrollers were older and smaller and couldn't effectively run a TLS stack. Nowadays, there's no excuse to skip it. Number four and a half, authenticate host certificates. TLS is not just data encryption, it's also server authentication. So, if you're using TLS, make sure your device is checking the fingerprint or certificate chain of the servers it's connecting to. We've seen some TLS implementations where it's possible to skip this, which makes man-in-the-middle attacks possible. Number five, turn off any unused services. If you have an embedded Linux or RTOS for your device, make sure there are no services left on, file sharing, remote login, mail servers, etc. These days, most of these services are not enabled by default, but check anyways. Sometimes they're left on during development and are forgotten when the firmware makes it to release. Five and a half, don't accept any inbound connections at all. If you can, don't allow any way for outside parties to connect into the device. If you have a debugging port left open, that's just another surface that can be attacked. Number six, require physical access for important configurations. We've seen some Wi-Fi cameras that can be controlled over the internet, but if you want to change the access point password, you need to plug it into a computer and change the setting over USB. This reduces the surface that can be attacked by automated scripts. Number seven, individualized, revocable authentication keys. In order for your device to connect to this service, chances are it has some sort of authentication key or password. As you remember from earlier, make sure that you have a unique key or password for each device. Even if the user never sees these, you shouldn't reuse them. You'll also need to have a way to revoke or reinstantiate keys if they're lost, corrupted, or stolen. Number eight, data paranoia. Even though you may only be shuffling data from your IoT device to your IoT service, don't trust that data is well formatted. This is often forgotten in the rush to complete and ship firmware, but you should assume that attackers will try to send corrupted or malformed chunks of data to both sides of the connection to corrupt memory. Clean up and vet data fully. This will also keep your device running smoothly if the network connection is flaky. Number nine, updatable firmware. Bootloaders are the best, and it's a good idea to have one on your device. There's many that can be write only so that deployed firmware can't be read back out. Being able to update a firmware will help customers recover the device if it gets bricked, hacked, or if there's an important security update. We like USB bootloaders the best, or ones where you insert an SD card with a file. Having updatable firmware increases your attack surface a bit because it gives another access point into your device, but we think that if someone has physical access, they could connect a JTAG programmer to erase and reprogram it anyways. Number 10, secure storage for authentication keys. Embedded Linux devices have a regular file system, and microcontrollers often store their code in flash memory. So if you're hard coding authentication keys in flash or EEPROM, it can be read out. Yes, even if you have a chip that has firmware readback turned off, it's sometimes possible to glitch chips into revealing their secrets. Your microcontroller memory should not be considered secure storage. Instead, you may want to consider using a secure element chip. These chips are designed to withstand common decapping and glitching attacks and can be programmed with your private key at the factory. Then, that key never leaves a secure chip. So instead of having the key sit in microcontroller memory where it could be read out, data that needs to be authenticated or encrypted is sent back and forth through the IC. It's a little extra cost, but it's a nice way to keep the secrets in a lockbox. Number 11, over-the-air updates. This one is a little tricky. Not having over the air is risky because then there's no way to send important security updates. On the other hand, having over the air is risky because it allows the attacker to completely take over the device if they hack it. We think over the air is a good idea, but you definitely need to combine it with the prior rules. Firmware must be transmitted over an authenticated, encrypted connection. 
Having firmware be signed with public key cryptography so the private key isn't stored on the device is a common idea, but be aware that private keys can and do leak out. So that should not be the only way that you verify firmware is valid. We've also seen more than one company accidentally brick their devices with a mistaken over-the-air update. Some even required a physical recall. So if you do have over-the-air updates, make sure you always have a way for physical access rollback. Number 12, have a security contact. This is last, but it's actually super easy. Make sure that your website has a policy and a way for folks to contact you if they think there's a security problem. There are lots of amateur and expert security researchers out there who are not only your customers, but potential customers. And many eyes can make flaws obvious, and those many eyes will let you know if they find a flaw. Don't let those emails go unread. Have someone who is an assigned security contact who will read and respond to any and all bug reports. Small gifts and rewards can encourage responsible disclosure and will motivate smart folks to help you out. Next up, service security. Servers have been hacked since the first ones were put online. So there's a lot of information out there on best security practices. Many of the recommendations we made for devices still stand. Require TLS, two-factor and strong passwords, scrub data to prevent buffer overflows or cross-site scripting attacks. There's a few more that relate specifically to IoT services. Misconfigured or glitching devices can turn them into unintentional mini denial of service attacks. If you get a device that is repeatedly sending your service bad data, make sure you have a way of throttling connectivity so that other customers don't get locked out. Contact or alert the customer to let them know about the misbehaving device. Provide a device health dashboard. Things like power and bandwidth usage, when reported back to the service, can help you spot if devices have turned into Bitcoin miners. Of course, these reports could be manipulated if the device is completely taken over, so you shouldn't only rely on them. Help protect customers from compromised accounts. Developers will accidentally commit their authentication keys. It happens all the time. That's why we had that earlier guideline to allow easy key revocation. A favor you can do for your users is to watch GitHub, Pastebin, and other code sharing services for credentials. Don't actually search for key values, of course. Look for stuff like your service name and words like password, API, or key. Protect yourself from compromise. Look out for world-readable or misconfigured cloud storage buckets and servers, Git repositories, and web directories. And of course, for both your IoT device and service, if it has a web interface, it should be protected against standard website hacking techniques like remote code execution, path traversal, cross-site request forgery, and SQL injection. There's lots of scanning services you can run against the website as well as on the code itself to find the most egregious errors. Use monitoring services on your own service. So meta. Hosting a service makes you an open target. And especially if you have a firmware deployment service, someone taking control of your site could not only take down your site, but they could take control of all the devices too. So checking your daily storage, bandwidth, and compute resource usage graphs, it's a good way to see if anything is amiss. This video is fairly short compared to the decades of security research out there. So we aren't able to cover everything, just the big picture. But here's the most important thing to realize. IoT will never be completely secure. By definition, having something be electronic and networkable means it can be hacked. And if you're in business long enough, your device will eventually have security flaws exposed. Now, it shouldn't be happening too often. And hopefully it isn't something obvious, but there's just too much code involved in an IoT device for it to be completely bug-free. Recognizing that you will never be 100% secure is that second half of Sun Tzu's quote about knowing the enemy and knowing thyself. And that will guide you through your IoT product design. You should assume that your firmware will be decompiled and that your service database will be downloaded. So think about how you can minimize the impact of those events. Don't store plain text data that once released is devastating. Don't write your own cryptographic functions that once reverse engineered unravel your network's authentication scheme. If you have to store data securely, rely on experts at services that do it well. They can be partners that let you focus on the customer experience while taking care of security. And most importantly, care about your customer data. To you, a leaked database is a statistic. To them, it's a tragedy.
Tell them that their security matters. Be open about how you're going to do it and listen when experts try to warn you about security flaws. When it comes to the internet and data security, your work is never done. As technology gets more connected and complex, there will be new hacking techniques discovered. We want to stress that security is not a one and done step of your product, but a philosophy that you'll need to keep in mind from prototype and deployment to long-term support. IoT inherits many of the security problems network computers have had for decades. So it's important for us as hardware engineers to learn from our fellow software and network engineers. As designers of IoT devices, you must use modern best practices in delivering secure products to end users. The reverse is also true. Investigate the market you're entering to see what security practices your competition practices or ignores. Keep tabs on the latest hacking announcements to make sure that your products are not similarly vulnerable. Reevaluate security on a periodic basis to review threats and revise software, access codes, and architecture as needed. Being transparent and open about security practices before, during, and after an issue will also demonstrate your commitment to security and fixing things when needed. And it will happen. We hope that during this episode, you realize how important it is to secure your IoT project, some of the best ways to go about it, and what to keep in mind when purchasing IoT devices. We hope that you've enjoyed this video series on the growing world of the Internet of Things. And when you're ready to get started with some hands-on experience, please check out all the IoT projects from DigiKey and Adafruit, and check back for the final video in the series, where we design a device with DigiKey's IoT Studio.